Welcome to Crema Media's Polity. I am Amy Witherden. I am at the Institute for Security Studies in Pretoria to meet with Tizina Ramachacha to discuss the review of South Africa's medical parole legislation. Tizina, you say in a recent paper that the one good thing about the release of Shabia Sheikh is that it has prompted a review of South Africa's medical parole legislation. What does the Correctional Services Act of 1998 say about medical parole? Uh, the Correctional Services Act, Section 79 of the Correctional Services Act is the act that specifically deals with um, medical parole. And it says that any, uh, any person or individual who has been sentenced, obviously, um, that uh, is uh, found to be, to, to be in the final stages of their terminal illness or condition, um, after being examined by a medical practitioner, can uh, be considered for medical parole. The aim of medical parole basically is to ensure that the uh, offender that uh, has been found to be terminally in the final phases of the terminal condition dies in a dignified manner. Please tell us about the issues considered at the January discussion led by the chairperson of the National Council of Correctional Services. Well, essentially the discussion that was uh, chaired by Judge Desai was uh, to look at the policy gaps um, in medical parole legislation, the apparent policy gaps in medical parole legislation. And one of the key issues that was identified was the uh, lack of clarity with regards to what was meant by terminally, final phases of your terminally ill condition. Um, there were cases where um, offenders would recover subsequently after being released on medical parole. And there were also, on the other hand, there were also cases of offenders uh, dying in correctional facilities. In um, the Judicial Inspectorate Correction of Correctional Services uh, report, and their recent annual report, 2008 and 2009, they reported that already early 2009, that there were 269 deaths that had occurred. In 1998, there were 982 deaths that, that had occurred. In prison? in the correctional facility. So this is according to a report by the Judicial Inspectorate of Correctional Services. It's their recent annual report. Um, and obviously that's po that points to a lot of uh, issues with regards to the definition of terminally ill or finally, final stages of a terminal illness and as well as the application um, of, the, uh, of that piece or that part of legislation. Another issue that was discussed was uh, considering like what happens if, uh, if offenders recover after the um, after they had been released on medical parole. Should they be reincarcerated um, or should they be placed on correctional supervision? What should we? Some of those issues were discussed, and if they were placed on correctional supervision, um, they had to consider issues of public safety, community safety. Uh, problems that the victims might have um, if uh, the offender is released, of, is put on correctional supervision. What do you make of the Department of Correctional Services finding that 60% of offenders released on medical parole actually make a full recovery, as well as the Judicial Inspectorate of Correctional Services report on natural deaths in prison? Does this suggest that the parole process is flawed both for those who do not receive medical parole and those who do? Well, I haven't seen the report. It hasn't been made public. Um, so we're, we're relying on media reports that we've seen um, that 60%, th there was a time that they reported that it was 65. So we haven't seen the research report. Um, so I'm not aware of how they report, how they reached the conclusion of that it was 60% of um, medical, of individuals that had been released on medical parole recovered. But I think that um, assuming that you know, uh, assuming that the report is accurate, um, I think we also have to take into consideration that the, there's a reason why the, um, the process took place in the first place, because the department does acknowledge that there are flaws um, with regards to how uh, medical parole is uh, legislated, first of all, and how it's, it's been conducted by the parole boards. There are flaws, um, and hence the review process. And I think they're aware of the um, findings of the Judicial Inspectorate of Correctional Services, of the number of deaths that are reported, the internal issues with regards to health care services and so on. They are aware of those uh, issues, hence the, rever the, the review process. There are a number of health workers and so on that were present at the meeting. So I think they are aware of the internal 
problems for the for individuals that are within the facility as well as individuals that are released um, outside after or the release on medical parole. Have any concrete resolutions come of this review? I don't know if we can say the concrete resolutions yet because this was a consultative process um, so they were still deliberating on the issues with regards to legislation and um, implementation so uh, we can only wait for the draft report which will be av made available I think uh, before the end of this financial year. Um, I think the, the department also mentioned that um, this matter needs to be you know, uh, cleared out before the end of this financial year, which will be the 31st of March. So we could only wait for the draft report and see what resolutions came out of the draft report, because um, this was a, it, it, this was a consultative, we were consulting a number of people, uh, stakeholders, to decide on the matter. Who was involved in the process? Well, uh, the minister was obviously there with her deputy, Klang um, Keys, as well as a number of people uh, f that were involved in the health health practitioners, uh, the heads of parole boards, um, the judicial inspector of correctional services, uh, as well as um, the National Council of Correctional Services, as you pointed out, who led the discussion. Um, they basically advised the minister on policies and um, services offered offered by the department. What measures do you suggest for the improvement of medical parole policy going forward? I think first of all we have to acknowledge that this uh, process, I think it's the beginning of uh, a very long journey. Um, it's the first time since it was discussed since, 19, since this legislation was put, uh, was, uh, was put in place in 1997. So it is the first time that you know, this consultative process is actually happening. So I think that it is a good thing that uh, medical parole is being discussed at this level. But I also think that it should uh, legislation. But I also think that it should be followed by um, clear guidelines and implementation um, issues. Also, have to be addressed um, because we have to look at the underlying factors of what causes the flaws in in, in, in medical parole. We have to look at issues around health care in, in correctional services. We also have to look at the underlying causes with regards to um, the medical parole boards. The training of medical parole board members is required. Um, uh, Lucas Munting also suggested that we should also look at restructuring of uh, correctional services uh, parole boards. Um, so there are several other issues that we need to be looking at um, uh, underneath underlying factors that cause um, uh, flaws in in, correction, in uh, the legislation or the the, the implementation of uh, of uh, medical parole. Um, another is issue I think we also have to look at is um, assessment. Pro there needs to be a proper assessment of offenders, the sentenced offenders as once uh, they are brought into the correctional facility. They need to be properly assessed in terms of their health conditions. Um, another issue that I think also needs to be addressed is the issue of victim involvement. We have to involve victims in uh, the legislating or the process of medical parole. So the victim would have a say in whether the person that did them wrong actually gets medical parole. Exactly. That that's that is sh how it should be because once if if it happens that the uh, victim recovers, I mean the um, offender recovers, the victim would ha also have a say in um, what should happen to the offender after the recovery. Um, okay. Another argument that was made: the issue of uh, whether the offender should be reincarcerated or. Um, left under correctional supervision, that there was an argument made by Jamil uh, Majuzi. He's a, he's a, uh, he used to work for the uh, Civil Society Prison Reform Initiative. It's an NGO, and um, though he basically said that there were several reasons why uh, someone would have to be reincarcerated, the offender would have to be reincarcerated after they have recovered, simply because they had violated their medical parole provisions. Um, because the assumption was that they were being released in, on medical parole because uh, they were found to be in the final stages of their terminal illness. And then once they recover, they have violated their, you know, their uh, parole, parole um, conditions. So since they violated the parole conditions, they would have to be returned to the uh, facility. 
but uh, there are also we also have to look at other issues or cost implications for that for, for the department uh, if if that occurs. You know, we already, they already have issues ar um, around healthcare provision and overcrowding, which has been an issue for the department for a number of years now. So they have to look at those issues, and we also have to look at. Um, I'm not saying that uh, offenders, especially in the case of if, if the offender is, 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 has been proven to be a repeat violent offender um, and has a potential to re-offend, then we also have, then re-incarceration sh should be an option in, in, in that regard and in that respect. But I don't think that if someone is, has, was, was, in, uh, was imprisoned for a petty crime and then was released on, on medical parole and then you know suddenly now you know and then suddenly they recover what should be done after that should be they've been reincarcerated or should they remain under correctional supervision they don't they, well they're not a danger to society if uh, they are uh, if, if they are freed because if they are left under correctional supervision because you know they were convicted of a petty crime um, not they don't have a history of reoffending so I think those are the issues that we need to be looking at um, when you're looking at uh, reincarceration or correctional supervision, the type of crime that the person was convicted for.